Okay, good evening, uh, guten Abend, uh, meine Damen und Herren. Ich werde weiterhin jetzt auf Englisch sprechen. Der ganze Abend ist ja auf Englisch. Um, dear guests, ladies and gentlemen and friends, uh, my name is Safir Cohen and I'm of Medico International. Hosting this event tonight is a privilege tinged with a bit of worry and dread, I must say. We're honored to have two brilliant authors with us tonight, uh, Nathan Thrall and uh, Joshua Jaffa, who will shortly be introducing themselves in length and discuss life, death, tragedy in Israel and Palestine. Yet, as news of the impending Israeli invasion of Rafa reaches us, we're fully aware of the monstrous consequences it entails. The total disregard for Palestinian lives, as well as the fate of the remaining Israeli hostages, it jeopardizes. Our thoughts this evening are with our brave partners in Gaza, working tirelessly for the victims of this man-made humanitarian catastrophe. When I say we, I mean Medico, a humanitarian aid and human rights organization. We work primarily by, financed by private donations in more than 30 countries, always by supporting progressive local partners, including in Israel and Palestine, where we have been active for several decades now. A note to our German-speaking guests, just and listeners, if they're new here, if you want to stay update with us and receive our information and analysis from an international perspective, please order our newsletter. Uh, because Medico, uh, again, is also a German organization. And what we're witnessing here is a growing trend of repression against Palestinian demonstrations and conferences, a clear violation of constitutional rights. State-funded and subsidized institutions are increasingly pressured to cancel public discussions or to penalize artists and intellectuals who have expressed criticism of Israel. Dozens of public events and performances have been canceled in Germany just in the last six months. We are therefore faced with the task of repeatedly keeping the spaces open for critical debates, even against the raison d'état, in German Staatsraison, in Germany that buys its way out of the past by uncritically supporting Israeli policy. Certainly, there are historical German peculiarities and sensitivities when it comes to dealing with Israel. But this should not by any means be a reason to restrict constitutional rights. But there is also something happening that cannot be explained solely by Germany's special path. We're witnessing the dramatic decline of Western dominance in the world. And since the Russian invasion of Ukraine, we've entered a war regime that divides the world into good and evil, friend and foe. The aim is to prepare the public for a war, a war that nobody really actually wants. A war into which people are staggering because they believe they can save their supremacy if necessary. Yet in this repressive atmosphere, we at Medico also see the, that our words do have power, that journalistic investigations, peaceful organizations and solidarity movements worldwide increasingly, increasingly can pose a threat to the highly militarized and unjust world order currently being enforced. This is precisely why it is so important to defend public spaces where people can speak and think beyond simply mor simple morality and free from slander and hatred. We at Medico will certainly make sure this evening, uh, ev and evenings like this one, uh, will uh, happen again and that spaces remain open. Uh, thank you very much, and I wanted to, to say just two little points. There is a live stream of this event. Please, please be aware of this. And the other thing is, after the event, um, the marvelous Bard College has uh, uh, made it possible that, there, uh, that we can all have some uh, drinks and something to nibble later on afterwards, so stay put. Thank you very much, Bard College. I'll uh, ask uh, Florian Becker, uh, the director of the Bard College in Berlin, uh, to the stage, please. Uh, please, Florian. Thank you so much. And <clears throat> I, too, I'm Florian Becker, the director of Bard College Berlin, um, fresh off the, the train. 
Um, I too am, um, excuse my voice, filled with a mix of emotions. Usually uh, university directors don't talk about a mix of emotions and I'm also aware that we're here to listen to Joshua and to Nathan. Um, so the first feeling I need to express nonetheless is our gratitude. Our gratitude to Medico International for stepping in at the last minute after our event at the uh, Union International Club was unfortunately uh, cancelled and uh, for providing us with this uh, beautiful venue. Um, my gratitude also to you. Um, it wasn't in my wildest dreams, at least until tonight, uh, that I was daring to hope for a room as full as this. Um, my second emotion, and this is where we come tonight, is joy. Uh, joy for being able and excitement for being able to listen to Joshua and especially of course uh, Nathan tonight and of course also uh, joy with Nathan and congratulations on the Pulitzer Prize that was announced last night at our last event uh, in the <laughs> Obviously, one other emotion that perhaps most of us in the room are feeling uh, is also one of uh, dread and concern about the assault that's currently going on and the continuing assault that uh, you have mentioned. Um, so that is part of the mix. And I have to say uh, that at a more parochial uh, level, another emotion that I feel is also one of um, concern and uh, disappointment and perhaps a little bit of anger at the uh, closing off of spaces that we are seeing at the moment in this country, also in, in some others, uh, where we need to see that in, in moments such as these, um, it's the mark of democratic discourse to face reality and speak about the different interpretations that we may have of reality and not to try to bracket the most difficult parts of that from uh, public space. Um, my last emotion then, I will hurry and uh, pass the microphone phone along. Uh, the last emotion I want to uh, mention is uh, pride. Um, we are happy and proud as Bard College Berlin to have organized with very much uh, um, um, Joshua's uh, help uh, this, uh, this event and the event yesterday and also with uh, Berit Ebert, my colleague's help. Um, and uh, it's uh, a pride that undergirds what we, what we experience in the college, uh, which is a place also, by the way, dependent entirely on donations, um, <laughs> which is a place in which uh, students from about 70 different countries and professors from a smaller but also significant number of, um, of countries gather and learn together for four years and uh, work across the obvious differences that exist in the beliefs and value systems and so on that they come with and where that isn't always easy but where that is always valued and where that always happens. So um, this should also be an invitation to you to learn about uh, Bard College Berlin uh, since we have a new captive audience. But let me come back to the first of these emotions which is the joy of being able to welcome uh, Joshua Yaffa and of course and Nathan Thrall to the stage tonight. I briefly want to just echo your words, uh, firstly with gratitude uh, for Medico International for uh, kindly hosting us at short notice. Indeed, it was a shame that our event at the Union Club was canceled without um, real substantive explanation or cause, um, but that really is, is their shame and the gain of all of us um, who are here uh, tonight, and so I'm grateful to, to Medico for providing the space, and as Florian said, to all of you for, for coming um, with um, curiosity and uh, eagerness to listen to Nathan, um, whom it's a great uh, privilege for me to now introduce. Uh, Nathan 
uh, as far as I'm concerned, the, the, the you know, most, um, uh, not necessarily important, but um, uh, the first part of his biography uh, is that uh, he's an old and dear friend of mine, and that's, that's what makes Nathan um, so special to me. More than uh, the litany of professional accomplishments I will now name, it's that uh, I've known him for his um, kindness, generosity, and warmth for, for many years, and it's an honor to host him in, uh, in Germany. Uh, Nathan moved uh, to Jerusalem 13 years ago, um, where he has written extensively on Israel, Palestine, uh, for such publications as the New York Review of Books, the London Review of Books, New York Times Magazine, Guardian, and others. Um, before that, or in concurrence with that, he was the director for many years of the Arab-Israeli Project at International Crisis Group. His reports there and writings elsewhere have been cited uh, in the United Nations Security Council, um, and other bodies such as Amnesty International Human Rights Watch. Last year, Nathan published an extraordinary book which will form the, the core of our discussion here tonight, A Day in the Life of Abed Salama, Anatomy of a Ju Jerusalem Tragedy, um, which was named Best Book of the Year by The New Yorker, Time, Economist, and others. And as we learned last night, uh, when our event ended and Nathan's phone suddenly started exploding um, inexplicably with calls and messages, uh, quickly learned that that book was uh, duly uh, honored with this year's Pulitzer Prize. So it's a special thrill for me to um, have witnessed that small moment of history, both uh, uh, my friend's history and uh, literary history. Um, so it's a joy to be here with Nathan tonight. I want to get you to talk a bit, uh, sort of set the scene um, of, of the book. For those who, who don't know, the, the core event or central event of Nathan's book is a bus crash that happens in Palestinian um, Jerusalem, um, a horrific bus crash that, that uh, involving kindergartners, uh, the human toll is high but uh, and, and quite devastating. Um, but we quickly learn or, or quickly understand that besides this t t terrible human uh, tragedy and, and, and trauma, especially for those children on the bus and their families, um, that this trauma and tragedy is compounded by a Byzantine system of, of control um, under which the Palestinian families um, live, a system of different colored IDs, separate roads, walls, checkpoints, um, a bureaucracy that it actually, in comparison to the terrible urgency of the crash, is actually quite plodding, almost boring by design uh, in some places. And, and I found that juxtaposition between the abject terror uh, of the crash itself and suddenly the way that that crash intersects with this more plotting bureaucratic world to be um, a, a startling and in very educational way feature of the book. And I would like to begin by having you, you set the stage of, of the crash itself, but also speak to that dichotomy between the terror and urgency of the crash and this bureaucratic world that lies just beyond it. Thank you. Um, is this mic working OK? Yeah. Um, thank you, Josh, and thank you all uh, for coming. Um, you know, the, the real aim of the book is to give the reader a visceral sense of what it's like to live in Israel-Palestine, and to do that by putting you in the shoes of uh, Jews and Palestinians uh, in this place. And, and the, the deeper subject of the book is the system of control. And that system, as Josh mentioned, is in many respects uh, dull, it's uh, complex, it's multi-layered, it's bureaucratic, um, but it is what uh, uh, perpetuates the system of control and keeps it in place uh, for more than half a century now. And uh, I felt that the only way to really illustrate uh, what that system means for ordinary people, how uh, deeply it uh, touches every aspect of their lives, including decisions over 
uh, whom uh, to marry was to uh, really put you closely uh, in the uh, shoes of individual people who are navigating that system. And the, the kind of deeper background to my choosing an event as commonplace as a, um, a bus accident uh, to, to tell a larger story about Israel-Palestine and about the system of control um, is that I have been working on this issue for uh, you know, 15 years and I have witnessed um, ebbs and flows in interest in Israel-Palestine. Right now we are in a period of peak interest in Israel-Palestine, it's uh, on the cover of all of the newspapers, on the front pages of all of the newspapers, and I have seen that happen in previous wars in Gaza and with other events, and uh, what happens during those periods of increased bloodshed is that the world calls to end it and to restore calm. And uh, the, the aim of this book, really, was to explore what that so-called calm actually looks like. It's anything but calm uh, for the Palestinians who are living in this system. And, uh, and only by addressing that system of control, that very uncalm uh, calm, uh, can we have any hope of not seeing Israel-Palestine on the front pages of the new newspaper because of renewed bloodshed. Um, so it was important to me to choose a commonplace event, not a war in Gaza, not a major incursion into the West Bank, to be able to really delve deeply into the system. Uh, and uh, for that reason, I, I chose to tell the story of a tragic uh, bus accident involving a group of kindergartners who live in the greater Jerusalem area. I live in Jerusalem. Um, and these people live um, just about two kilometers away from me, but on the other side of a 26 foot tall uh, concrete wall. And they live in a community that is today about 130,000 people that is very tightly packed and utterly neglected by design. This a wall surrounds this community on three sides, and on a fourth side is a different kind of wall that runs through a segregated road, Route 4370, with traffic uh, for Israelis on one side, Palestinians on the other, famously referred to as the Apartheid Road, and it has its own uh, fence and, and tall wall running through the middle of it. So this community is entirely encircled by walls, there is one checkpoint to exit toward Jerusalem for those who are fortunate enough to have the necessary permits to enter Jerusalem, where many of the uh, employers and um, uh, schools and uh, medical services that these people rely on uh, are. Um, and then another exit uh, at the other end of the community that all members of, of the community can go through. And it is very, very easy to close this uh, community of 130,000 people. In fact, it takes about four soldiers to do it. You just close one gate and you close another and you're done. Uh, and that's happened quite recently uh, in this community which is called Anata. Um, and it's also within this uh, walled enclave, it is a, a refugee camp, um, uh, the Shuafat refugee camp. And within, within this walled enclave, you have two different uh, statuses of territory as far as Israel is concerned. Uh, one is, in Israel's view, the sovereign territory of Israel that has been formally annexed in 1967. Uh, so half of this community, including the Shuafat refugee camp and one of the neighborhoods of the town of Anatta, uh, were formally annexed by Israel in 1967, and the people there pay uh, municipal taxes uh, to the Jerusalem municipality, and they receive virtually no services. And it's so bad that uh, even emergency services will not go into this area without an army uh, or police escort. Um, and then beyond that, uh, there is within the same enclave unannexed territory, 
But when you enter this enclave, you cannot tell what is annexed and what is not annexed. You need to be an expert to know where sovereign Israel has ended and the uh, unannexed part of the West Bank has begun. The way to tell is actually you go and you look very closely at the buildings and you look for the last building that has a little blue placard with uh, white lettering uh, that uh, indicates uh, that it's uh, within the municipal uh, boundaries of Jerusalem. Um, so the, the people in this community, they live without um, uh, playgrounds, without sidewalks, uh, the, many of the roads are in total disrepair, uh, and this is about 130,000 people that have one single artery that runs through this main artery for the, for the community that is so narrow that when I enter it, I need to pull in the side mirror of my, my vehicle in order to let a bus pass in the opposite direction. And you can imagine the kind of traffic that builds up uh, because of all the people that have to take uh, buses on this road. And all of this is sitting just beneath the manicured grounds of the most prestigious university in Israel, the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, the uh, Mount Scopus campus. And from those grounds, you can look down and you can see the checkpoint and you can see the roads in disrepair and you can see the absence of playgrounds. And just on the other side of the wall is uh, Pisgat Ze'ev, is uh, uh, French Hill, uh, Jewish neighborhoods that are uh, quite affluent. And the uh, situation of neglect in this area is so great, uh, it's a widespread problem in East Jerusalem. Uh, there's a shortage of classrooms, and in particular in this community, there's really a shortage of uh, municipal schools. And so the parents there are forced uh, the ones who do have the ability to enter Jerusalem, who have the right kind of permit and the right color ID card to enter Jerusalem, uh, they have a choice. They can send their kids through a checkpoint uh, every morning and every afternoon and have to dangerously confront Israeli soldiers just going to and from school. Or they could send them to a, a private school in the unannexed part of this uh, community. And that's what uh, the story of this book um, is. It's, it's about one of these private schools in Anatta, in this enclave, in the unannexed part, um, where these uh, parents who pay taxes, municipal taxes to the city of Jerusalem, receive no services, nevertheless go and they take their kids and put them in a, in a West Bank private school. And the kids in this school are some of them have come from families with blue Jerusalem IDs, some with green West Bank IDs, and because the kids can't all go through the checkpoint to the nearby play areas just on the other side of the wall, they need instead, when they have a, a class excursion, to go along the winding path of this barrier to a very distant play area at the outskirts of Ramallah. And uh, one February morning that was very rainy, um, a terrible storm, th this kindergarten class went to this play area and it passed through a uh, checkpoint. And shortly thereafter, it was struck by a giant uh, semi-trailer. And that semi-trailer was uh, on its way to a settlement quarry, which is, um, a uh, Israeli settlement extracting the natural resources of the West Bank to bring them to a factory in East Jerusalem for the paving of roads inside Israel. Uh, this uh, semi-trailer struck the bus. The bus flipped over, uh, caught fire, and uh, the uh, children were trapped inside. It was more than uh, half an hour before the first Israeli uh, fire truck arrived on the scene. And this occurred on a road in what is defined as Area C of the West Bank, the roughly 62% of the West Bank that is not just <coughs> under Israel's full security control, but under its uh, full administrative control as well. Israeli police uh, uh, operate on these roads. There's this mistaken notion that it's only the army that operates in the West Bank. 
Um, no, all the Israeli government ministries are operating in the West Bank. The West Bank uh, has been absorbed by Israel, and so it, it's the Israeli national police that give out traffic tickets on this road. It is under their full responsibility, uh, and uh, they're nowhere to be seen. And so who is left to try and rescue these children from this uh, burning bus are uh, just ordinary people who happen to be on this road, which is a road that's used mainly by Palestinians, which is why it took so long for the Israeli emergency services to come. Um, and uh, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll read a short passage from the book that describes the end of that rescue. Um, and, and the two things to know is really just the names of two people. One is uh, a doctor who works for the UN Refugee Agency, UNRWA. Um, her name is Huda, Huda Dahbur, and uh, she is a doctor and a mother, and she happens to be on her way uh, with her medical team to a, a visit to a Bedouin uh, uh, encampment called uh, Khan al-Ahmar, a very famous one, frequently in the news because it's constantly at risk of uh, being uh, destroyed and, and the population uh, uh, displaced. Um, and she gets out of her van and tries to help rescue these children. The other name to know is Salem, and that is a man who lives near the accident site, who uh, heroically entered this burning bus uh, repeatedly and saved dozens of children together with uh, one uh, teacher named Ula. <clears throat> Nearly 20 minutes had passed since Huda and her staff had come upon the burning bus. Flames and smoke were still pouring from the smashed windows. Huda's driver, Abu Faraj, was directing traffic, keeping an open path for the evacuees and telling drivers of oncoming cars to turn back. The crowd had grown so large that Huda could no longer see the driver and the teacher she and Salem had pulled from the front of the bus. She was focused on the children, gently carrying them with one of the UN nurses to the cars that had stopped at the accident site. Many of the drivers had volunteered to transport the burn victims and stood ready to race to the nearest accessible hospital, which, for most of them, was in Ramallah. The hospitals in Jerusalem were far better, but only those with blue IDs could reach them. A few of the drivers did have blue IDs, and some took off in the direction of Hadassah Hospital at Mount Scopus in Jerusalem. The majority, those with green IDs, went in the opposite direction, along the flooded road to Ramallah. Nearly all the children had been brought off the bus when Salem, who had by now gone in and out of the flames several times, saw that Ula, the teacher and his partner in the rescue, was trapped beneath a front seat and her leg was burning. But by the time he got to her, it was too late. She was gone. He carried Ula from the bus and placed her on the ground. Her nephew, Sadi, watched in the rain while a man covered her with his coat. In all of this, Salem had felt nothing, not even as someone in the crowd grabbed at his arm and pinched him. One of Huda's nurses yelled to him that his jacket was on fire. He shouted back that it was not. The nurse put it out as he went to climb back into the bus. The few children still inside were no longer alive. The last boy Salem pulled out was facing down, crouched behind the frame of a seat. He was still wearing a backpack, which Salem held to pick the boy up. Stepping out of the bus for the final time, Salem broke out weeping, shouting that he should have saved more. Somehow, not a hair on his head was burned. Abu Faraj stood unmoving in shock, as if mesmerized by the flames. Huda turned to the nurse beside her and saw that her face was black and streaked by rain. She realized she must look the same. They were soaked and bone-weary, and there was nothing more for them to do. When a Palestinian ambulance finally arrived, most of the injured children had already been evacuated. Huda didn't even notice it. The bus was still crackling with flames and there was much shouting and commotion. 
Not a single firefighter, police officer, or soldier had come. Huda wanted to follow the children. She found her team and they returned to the Unruh van. Nida, the pregnant pharmacist, was still inside, inconsolable. Abu Faraj started dropping off everyone at home as Huda called around and confirmed that most of the children were in Ramallah. Then she phoned her UNRWA supervisor. He didn't understand the magnitude of the accident and demanded that the team turn around and go to Khan al Ahmar or he would cut their pay. Huda refused and said he should cut just her salary, no one else's. After stopping for a quick shower, Huda set off for the hospital, taking the clinic's social worker with her. When they got there, word spread that Huda had been at the crash. A great many parents and other relatives sought her out, asking whether she had seen a boy with a Spider-Man backpack, a girl with her hair and yellow ribbons. Huda told them all the same thing. The children had been covered in soot, and she couldn't tell what they were wearing. Going from room to room, Huda checked on the injured children, soothing them. Since leaving the bus, she had felt something nagging at her. She was sure the kindergartners had been silent, at least early in their ordeal. Now, at the bed of one girl, Huda asked her why that was, why she had heard no sound. We were so scared, the girl said. When we saw the flames, we thought we had died. We thought we were in hell. I'm glad you read us that quite affecting and haunting passage because it highlights two things about the book that I think are incredibly important and what make it such a success. Um, the first is that this is not uh, a work of political uh, polemic. It's, it's really a literary uh, achievement um, as much as it is a work of politics um, or morals. And I think that that passage highlights um, in, indeed what a um, powerful work of, of nonfiction literature uh, you've written. And, and I myself read the book as much through that lens as I do uh, through the lens of um, politics and the Israel-Palestine conflict. And I encourage others to, to do the same. Um, the second is the way you build, nonetheless, the moral component of the book, uh, which by the end comes through very clearly, not because you um, yell uh, or kind of harangue us um, with, by sort of beating your chest, making your points, using jargon, or, or kind of relying on arguments that are so often surfaced by one side um, or the other, but by marshalling in a very uh, cool, dispassionate, um, combining the skills of both a, a storyteller and a prosecutor um, detail that, that make the point far more powerfully and far more convincingly than if you wrote a 200-page work uh, of political polemic. And the one of the main ideas that I was left with by the time I, I finished the book, which I, I felt was you were marshalling this point purposely, even if you never came out and announced it directly, was that this event that you and I tonight are referring to as a bus accident is actually not quite an accident, that, that maybe that's not the best word for it. Um, of course, there is an element of, of terrible chance, this awful rainstorm, the driver of the semi-truck who was inexperienced and made bad decisions behind the wheel. But there are also elements that existed for years, in fact, generations. Uh, you described them in your opening remarks, an entire system, a system that was designed by people. It was purposeful and it was maintained, maintained not just by Israel, but by Israel's partners and backers in the West, the United States and Europe. And so I'd like you to talk about this notion of the bus accident as not quite an accident and, and how you see a system uh, that was built and maintained that perhaps didn't quite make this accident in this particular form inevitable, but yet nonetheless put in place the forces that led to the outcome that you describe in your book. 
Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean that. What you began with was was very much my um, desire. My goal with the book was um, to avoid any kind of uh, not just polemic, but really any kind of uh, omniscient uh, narration that I would come in and you know say as the as the narrator that in 1967 you know there was the June War, etc. Um, it was, it's all told through the perspectives, the histories, the personal and family histories of the characters. And the real aim was to tell the whole story of Israel-Palestine through the eyes of the people uh, living there. And I felt that there would be um, no stronger indictment of this system of control and to just describe it in the most neutral possible terms and let the reader uh, understand what it actually entails. Um, and, and, you know, you're right. I mean, of course the accident uh, was accidental. The driver didn't intend to strike uh, the bus and uh, kill uh, kindergartners and, and the teacher. Uh, and it, there was a storm and he was um, not properly trained in the braking system. Uh, he didn't quite know how to use properly. Um, but everything that transpired once this crash happened uh, was all too predictable, was a predictable consequence of creating the wall and routing it in with a demographic objective. The demographic objective of Israel in routing the wall and creating this community filled with people who are Jerusalem residents, who pay municipal taxes to Jerusalem, who ought to have uh, rights for the Israeli state to decide actually our primary objective in routing this wall is to push as many Palestinians as possible out of the heart of the city. That was the objective. And uh, so many other things follow from that. The utter neglect of these people once the wall has been put up. Uh, and not just them, but also Palestinians outside of uh, uh, and next municipal Jerusalem, but still on the other side of the wall in areas that the Palestinian Authority is forbidden from accessing, uh, who are living in a state of deliberate neglect in the place that Israel covets most. Um, and, you know, I, I although I, I really avoided uh, any kind of uh, uh, polemic, polemic or insertion of myself and my views uh, or my conclusions in the book, in the very final page, I, I, um, I part uh, from that. I felt the reader needed a summing up. And, um, and so if you don't mind, I, I will just uh, actually talk about those inevitabilities of, 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 the, of the accident that were driven by policy. Days after the accident, the PA formed a ministerial committee to investigate the causes. Its report noted that the nearest Israeli ambulance, emergency services, and fire station are only a minute and a half away, while sending, quote, Palestinian ambulances and emergency vehicles to the Jabba Road requires coordination with Israel. Also, Palestinian emergency services were impeded by the suffocating traffic at the Kalandia and Jabba checkpoints, and previous Palestinian requests to install lighting and a central divider in the road had been, quote, rejected by Israel. In sum, this placed the moral and legal responsibility on the Israeli side, end quote. The bereaved parents dismissed the report as shoddy, rushed, and inaccurate, aimed at covering up the PA's own inadequate rescue and its negligent oversight of the schools and their safety. For all the blame that was cast, no one, not the investigators, not the lawyers, not the judges, named the true origins of the calamity. No one mentioned the chronic lack of classrooms in East Jerusalem, a shortage that led parents to send their children to poorly supervised West Bank schools. No one pointed to the separation wall and the permit system that forced a kindergarten class 
to take a long, dangerous detour to the edge of Ramallah, rather than driving to the playgrounds of Pisgat Ze'ev, a stone's throw away. There was no suggestion that Israel's fund for accident victims should compensate the families of green ID holders, whose children were killed on a road controlled by Israel and patrolled by its police. No one argued that a single badly maintained artery was insufficient for the north-south transit of Palestinians in the greater Jerusalem er Ramallah area, or objected that the checkpoints were used to stem Palestinian movement and ease settler traffic at rush hour. No one noted that the absence of emergency services on one side of the separation wall was bound to lead to tragedy. No one said that the Palestinians in the area were neglected because the Jewish state aimed to reduce their presence in greater Jerusalem, the place most coveted by Israel. For these acts, no one was held to account. Tell us a bit about your relationships with the subject of the book. Of course, Abed Salama, the father of the boy who, uh, of a boy who's on the bus and it's this anguished father's quest to find his son that forms um, in a way the kind of main narrative frame or arc of the book. But there are other characters you mentioned, you mentioned Huda who arrived at the scene uh, to witness the, have witness the aftermath of the crash and tried to save some of the kindergartners inside. You brought to the crash, which you were reporting on years after the fact, um, a clear idea that it contained this allegorical power or a kind of key that would unlock this system uh, of control in the West Bank and allow you in detail, rather than describing it in kind of broad political terms, but to really pick it apart, dissect it, and um, describe how it works in everyday life, um, that it had this power beyond just the event itself. Of course, for the families involved, first and, and, and foremost, it, it was an incredible uh, personal tragedy and trauma. And, and the question is, as you explored uh, this event and its aftermath, as well as the preceding biographies of these characters, you know, what did they make of your understanding um, of what for them is the worst day in their lives, right? Um, and, and what did they, how did they think of this event? Did they see it in similar terms as you? Did, did they understand what you were doing? Um, and how did your relationships with them begin and, and develop over time? So um, I have to say, you know, this book couldn't have been written without the enormous uh, trust that was placed in me by um, the uh, characters in this book, and uh, in particular to the uh, title character, Abed Salama. Um, after I received the news last night, I called him uh, to tell him first, and he um, had cried and sent me a, a very emotional note afterward, and um, there was no one who, who, whose uh, response to, to the news was, was more important to me. Um, and, and with Abed in particular, it was a process of being with him for years um, and talking to him about the most intimate details of his life, which are on the page. Um, because the aim of the book, again, was to create a very realistic picture, um, a picture of three-dimensional human beings, um, and, and I, needed, I needed to show, uh, to show them in their fullness, and that required uh, a great deal of trust. In terms of the, um, the conception of this accident as an allegory or as a means to explain uh, Israel-Palestine, to explain Israeli uh, control over Palestinian lives, um, I think people, you know, for the most part understood it when I explained it to them. I think they maybe were a little bit skeptical that that's, I would succeed in doing that. Um, but there was a disjunct between my own view of the accident as this 
perfect means of describing the system. Also, for, for reasons that are not interesting to go into here, but just to the ge geography of it even. Uh, Anatta is a, is a town which has had l literally every single means of land confiscation applied to it. Parts of it have been formally annexed, parts of it have been made a military base, parts of it have been a, made a nature reserve for settlers, part of, parts of it have been made official settlements, parts of it have been made a segregated road, parts of it are the famous E1 area that is, is constantly being uh, promised uh, as, as a new uh, Israeli expansion in the West Bank. Um, and so the geography of it and the proximity to, to Jerusalem and and parts of the story take place in Jerusalem, um, that also allowed me to really delve into so much of the, of the history here. Um, but for the most part, when I talked to the parents about the actual cause of the accident, their view was different than mine, uh, in that they were focused on very proximate causes. They really wanted to uh, talk about the neglect of the driver, the mistakes that the driver made, the neglect of the uh, Palestinian Authority in uh, allowing this bus that wasn't properly registered to run a dilapidated, very old uh, bus that caught fire very easily. Um, they were focused on these very narrow uh, and, and proximate causes. And when I would say to them, absolutely, and that's part of the story, and I'm going to describe all of that, but you know, don't you think that we should talk, don't you think that ultimately this whole sequence of events unfolded because there was a wall that was created around your community and you had no classrooms and you were forced to send your children to the school and because there were kids with green and blue IDs on the bus they couldn't go to the nearby play area and they went to this far one and this whole area is entirely neglected and emergency services by Israel don't come to these areas because they're populated by Palestinians and the priority is to attend to the Jewish settlers in the area and they would all say yeah of course of course all of that that is the real cause, the deep cause of the accident, but it wasn't even worth mentioning to them because they take it so for granted. There's, it's so beyond their imagination that they, that, that could be reformed, that that could be changed. That is, is a given. That is the, the air that they breathe. And, um, and it, it you know, reminds me of this uh, famous... Um, uh, graduate commencement speech that uh, the novelist David Foster Wallace uh, once gave and was very widely circulated, where he tells an anecdote that I probably uh, will uh, misremember the, some of the details, but the, the essence of it is that there are uh, two fish uh, passing one another and uh, in the sea, and, and the one fish uh, says to the other, uh, how's the water today? And the other fish replies, what's water? And, um, and so that was very much what it was like in a way to, dis to talk to these people who were connected intimately with the crash to talk, tell them how I was going to use the crash to talk about water. This is a book that's going to actually be about the water. And so it, I really had to just do it. Um, they agreed with me that that's the case. Um, but, um, but I was the one who was coming to it with that perspective. The book is, of course, set in Jerusalem and the West Bank. After October 7th and the Israeli invasion of Gaza that followed, uh, our attention shifted primarily to, to Gaza, where you have also, over the years, traveled and reported from extensively. And I'd like you to talk to us about daily life in Gaza, the, the, wa the air, the water, uh, to continue your, your metaphor, in Gaza, on the one hand, you didn't have the same immediate, ever-present Israeli physical presence in Gaza after the uh, pullout in 2005, at least not in the same way with settlements and um, Israeli police and so on that you had in the West Bank, um, a blockade versus an occupation and so on. But nonetheless, maybe there are, are more similarities than might meet the eye in, in terms of how daily life was experienced and lived 
in Gaza until October 7th. And so, and so tell us what that life looked like, how it was organized, its rules, um, and, and so on, and, and give us an experience of the, the fabric of that existence and how it was both similar, but perhaps in some important ways different than the life that you describe in your book. Yeah. So, um, you know, on the one hand, um, Gaza is very, very different from uh, the West Bank. It's culturally different from uh, the West Bank. Um, it is, of course, now for a very long time been uh, isolated by Israeli restrictions, so it's very hard for Palestinians in Gaza to go to the West Bank and, and vice versa for West Bankers to, to go to Gaza. Um, and, and so Gazans have really seen very little of the outside world uh, for the last uh, couple decades. Um, and in addition, you know, Gaza has historically borne the brunt of Israeli military power. It has been the center of Palestinian nationalism. It's where the leadership of the PLO uh, and Fatah came from. Uh, it's where there was the fiercest uh, resistance in the early years of Israel's occupation. Um, and, uh, and so, in many times when I would go to Gaza, it would almost, I would describe it as time travel because it felt like I was entering an earlier era of Palestinian nationalism. Um, and, um, and, you know, the atmosphere in the West Bank is what m much more one of discussions of anomi and, you know, our leadership has all sold out and everyone's in it for themselves and they're just cooperating with Israel and trying to pocket whatever profits they can from this awful system that they're perpetuating. Uh, whereas in Gaza, it was really much, a much different uh, kind of uh, conversation and a much le less of that feeling of, of, of anomi and, and despair. Um, and there was something also really uh, vital and, and refreshing about being in, in a place where there was also more hope. Um, but that said, you know, those cultural and historical differences aside, in terms of the system of Israeli control, there are actually a great many uh, similarities. You would be surprised how similar, actually, uh, Israel's means of control in Gaza are to those means in the West Bank and in communities like this one. Um, so after uh, the Israeli withdrawal in 2005, Israel continued to occupy and control Gaza from the outside, and it would make uh, incursions into Gaza uh, at will, much like in the city centers of the West Bank, the Area A, um, where you have Ostensibly, you have limited Palestinian autonomy in those areas, but Israel still goes in at will. And the basic attitude, it's a geographical uh, attitude, which is uh, all of the areas that are so densely populated that Israel has no hope of settling them with uh, Jew Jewish settlements. Um, those areas we're just going to wall off and we're going to outsource the administration of those areas. And Gaza is an example of that. It's very dense and urban. And Nata and Shuafat camp is another. It's a walled enclave. They've just walled it off and neglected it. There are a couple of tiny exceptions to this rule. In East Jerusalem and in Hebron, there are small groups of Israeli uh, settlers who are actually trying uh, to take over a, an urban area like downtown Hebron where uh, they are greatly, greatly outnumbered by Palestinians. Uh, but for the most part, the settlement project is about expanding in more sparsely populated areas. And in the more densely populated areas, you have a Gaza-like approach, which is wall it off, let it have some kind of self-administration and go in and do uh, military operations uh, at will, and, and in a way, you know, you would hear more and more in recent years, Palestinians talk about Gaza as, as, Gaza as a model for the West Bank, that you would have a series of little Gazas, a little isolated enclaves that uh, Israel treats like Gaza within the West Bank. 
And, and really, I think the, the biggest, one of the biggest changes that happened as a result of, of the uh, Israeli withdrawal and, and the um, uh, you know, walling off of, of Gaza it, is that Israel behaved with much more brutality uh, in Gaza. And so you would talk to soldiers who served in the West Bank and did their first you know, war in Gaza and they were shocked at what they were being commanded to do. It was things they had never been told to do in the West Bank. They'd control an area, a neighborhood, for some period of time during a war, and then at the end of it, they are told, we're flattening the neighborhood. And they say, what, we're flattening? The we don't do that in the West Bank. We don't flatten neighborhoods after we do an incursion. But, uh, but you do in Gaza. And, and um, and so I, I, I would say that, you know, on the whole, it, it's really a picture, it's more of a similarity than, than it is a difference, the, the control of Gaza. In the book, characters like Abed Salama, of course they live within a larger system that you describe in the book, and, and tonight that has been designed and is maintained by Israel, that's the kind of superstructure. Um, but in following this model that you described, that actually, in a sense, began in Gaza, but is more and more common in the West Bank, um, certainly daily life, you don't see many Israelis, you're not interfacing with Israelis, you're interfacing more often uh, with other Palestinians who are in positions of, uh, whether in the security forces, uh, political or government administration, and, and so on. And, and I want to kind of return <coughs> some agency to, to Palestinians, both on the level of day-to-day -day life, but also on kind of bigger politics and diplomacy, and talk about, um, we'll, we'll move toward this in a moment, this idea of solutions, even though I know you're, you're skeptical about that, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about why, but um, what is the role for Palestinian agency? Um, how did it play out in the context of the story you're telling in your book, but also how do you see it in the larger picture of, yes, Israel is the state that maintains this um, system of, of control and certainly in a question of hard power has overwhelming superiority and is able to exercise its will, but that doesn't mean there's zero space for a will or agency um, of the Palestinians and, and how did that, how did that play out in the context of the story you tell in your book, and, and how do you see that as relevant when we think about bigger uh, shifts in um, politics and diplomacy to the extent that those are even possible? So, I mean, within the story of the accident, the, the accident took place, as I say, in Area C, which is under Israel's full control, it's under its security control, its administrative control, so Palestinians, the Palestinian Authority really has uh, zero agency there, zero power. In this particular case, there was, it was such a terrible case of neglect that uh, uh, Palestinian security force members who were not in uniform came uh, to the scene and then there was a discussion with the Israeli commander and for the only time that I know of uh, in, in uh, the, the West Bank, the Israeli security commander uh, granted the Palestinians there in Area C, which is their Israeli area, they granted them uh, control of the accident site uh, with Israel controlling it from, from outside. Um, and, and so, you know, it, there was this kind of uh, request that was made uh, to the Israelis, an unprecedented request of, you know, it's all Palestinians here on the scene, you're gonna have more friction if you deal with it yourself. There's a lot of anger over how late the uh, emergency response was, and so it'll be better for you if we intervene, even though this is wounding to your pride as controlling Area C. Um, and, and, and that was granted. Um, but you see how narrow the scope is for Palestinian assertion of uh, any kind of uh, real power and, and, and control is. And, and if we zoom out to the, to the, to the bigger um, uh, picture, I mean, in a way, so part of it is just there is this enormous discrepancy in power. And 
um, you know, ultimately Israel is the giant and Palestinians, militarily speaking, are an ant. And, um, and so, so, you know, that is reflected in the negotiating room. You see it time and again, you see it in some of the discussions that, that took place over Oslo and in this book. Palestinians screamed, we would never be your subcontractors, we're, you're giving us cantons, you're giving us bantustans, this whole Oslo thing, you're imprisoning us. Uh, this, this is a system of cantonization, Arafat was screaming it. Um, but he accepted it in the end because um, what 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 other choice did he have? And um, and so you know I, I think that the real story of the the Palestinian negotiators since the peace process began has been basically uh, you know we have made our historic concession by finally after decades and decades of pressure we have accepted to have a state on 22% of our homeland. We're half the population that's under Israeli control, or even more if you count our people who are in refugee camps and prevented uh, outside of Palestine and prevented from entering even the occupied territories. Uh, and half the people under Israeli control, and we're accepting homeland on 22% discontinuous two basically glorified Bantustans, uh, that is our historic concession. This is the greatest deal you could imagine. And Israel said, no, that that's, your, that's your maximalist position. Um, and and uh, the most you could ever demand is a state on the pre-67 borders. Um, and, and so that's, we'll now enter negotiations and talk about what you're going to concede on top of that. And then there have been many more concessions, again, because of the great power disparity, there have been many more concessions that have been made. Uh, Palestinians agreed that, you know, uh, uh, that there would be all kinds of limitations on the state's sovereignty, and there would be not just blacklists of weapons that, are, that the state could have, but white lists. And, um, you know, Israel was going to keep, you know, a huge percent of the settler population in place, and on and on and on. Um, so, so I do think, you know, the power disparity is really central to understanding what's happened. But in terms of talking about Palestinian politics and pal Palestinian agency, it's also the case that many Palestinians don't support what their leadership has been doing in these negotiations, or if they once did feel that they no longer do because it's proven to be such a uh, dead end. Um, and so you have uh, really a wide array of uh, views that are not reflected in the uh, uh, negotiating positions of the official representative of the Palestinians, the PLO. A last question or two for me before we turn it over to, to the audience and prepare your, your questions. Um, I foreshadowed a minute ago that I, I know, because I, I know you for so many years, about your allergy or aversion to, to skipping forward to talking about how we solve this. Um, you're wary of a kind of um, impulse towards solutionism where we distract ourselves from clearly identifying and documenting reality as it exists today by telling ourselves that's only temporary and we'll soon get to this um, more idealized future that's more palatable, yet we somehow manage to never get there, but we still tell ourselves that's where, where we're headed. Um, so, so tell us, before I ask my question nonetheless, before I dare to ask a question about, about the future, um, tell us a bit because I think it's relevant to why you wrote this book and how you wrote it, why you think this fixation on talking about solutions, final status, you know, what's this agreement gonna look like? Um, what's your aversion to that? Why do you think it's either distracting or counterproductive? And, and, and then how and why did you lead, uh, end up taking a different approach with this book? Thank you. Um, 
You know, I, I think it's it's worse than uh, uh, distracting. I, I think it's it's very uh, it's a deliberate uh, ruse. It's it's putting a carrot in front of a donkey <laughs> and getting them to move along and never letting them eat the carrot. Um, and um, and and I I really you know the endless discussion of uh, what kind of two-state solution uh, ought there be, should there be a one-state solution instead, um, there is zero evidence that we are moving in the direction of any, uh, any of those things, of a one state with equality for all, of two states. It's, it's the opposite that you see happening on the ground. What you see on the ground every day is more Israeli control, absorption of the West Bank, integration into Israel, no distinction between Israeli settlements and uh, uh, Israel proper, uh, Supreme Court justices and ministers and senior commanders in the army and l captains of industry and members of Knesset, they're living in settlements and they have uh, Israeli HMOs and Israeli street signs and Israeli police stations and they have Israeli uh, fire trucks and they have Israeli schools and they are in Israel and they're going seamlessly to their jobs and we all maintain this fiction that that's temporary and that's not really Israel. And Israel's a democracy because we are saying Israel ends only at the 67 borders. It doesn't include its control of millions of Palestinians without basic rights. But if you actually look at the territory Israel controls, you can't define it as a democracy because no democracy has deprived millions of people of basic civil rights for over half a century. So it's only this, this kind of mental construct that we create. That's temporary, it doesn't really count. It's not really the state of Israel. It's the Israeli Ministry of Transportation paving those roads. It's the Israeli uh, High Court of Justice. That's the final court of appeal for all the people living in the territory. Uh, it's Israeli um, um, ministers and, and Israeli um, uh, Knesset committees that are approving the projects in the West Bank. So, um, so, so I think that there, there is an element of magical thinking about what the reality is in, in Israel-Palestine. And, and, um, and so we're moving toward greater and greater segregation, Israeli absorption of Area C and uh, the settlements within it, uh, expansion of those settlements, Palestinians constricted into tighter and tighter uh, places, little walled enclaves like uh, Shuafat and Anatta. And, uh, and in the meantime, you know, there's a group of people, uh, very powerful people, uh, leaders of commentary in the, in the mainstream press, who would like you to look away. Don't look at that. Let's, let's not talk about the expansion of those uh, settlements. Let's not talk about the displacement of thousands of uh, uh, Palestinians in, in Area C. Um, let's not talk about administrative detention, the process of holding uh, Palestinians without trial or charge indefinitely for six months renewable indefinitely. Let's not talk about kids being grabbed from their parents in the middle of the night by the army for throwing stones at an occupying army. Uh, and then facing a military court justice system that gives them a 99% conviction rate. Look away from that. Let's talk about what kind of fountain would you like in the, in the town square of our future utopia? Would you like a one state or two state? It's important that we decide on that first before we address any of this. We, can, we, we, can't, we can't actually address any of that until we've all agreed that we've got the perfect solution. So um, I think it is a means of evading accountability and it is a means of continuing a deeply, deeply unjust system. I'm sympathetic uh, as a journalist myself, albeit uh, on a very, very different geography in subject matter, the way that um, we can be accused of, of pessimism for engaging in um, honest uh, and clear-eyed realism. And so I appreciate that, that answer. Um, the last question for me is, a, is about 
the future, not so much uh, a possible solution, maybe the impossibility or the difficulty, if not impossibility, of one based on the world or growing out of the world that you describe in the book, that is this discontiguous um, West Bank chopped into small enclaves divided by walls, checkpoints, roads, um, IDs, and, and so on. And that if you look at a map, this is less a state than small dots um, unconnected to, to each other. And I'd like you to talk about how that reality makes the idea of this um, you know, future utopia that you describe seem kind of a fantasy from a bygone era, but also um, with every passing day more and more functionally impossible to imagine for the future. And perhaps in, in doing so, you could also read us a last passage from the book before we hear from the audience. Uh, thank you. Um, so clearly the uh, uh, encroachment of Israeli settlements, the expansion of Israeli settlements, the absorption of Israeli uh, settlements and settlement infrastructure into the Israeli state just by definition makes it more costly to ever uh, undo those things. Uh, it will be more expensive, it will be more politically costly is the real thing. Um, but, but also just materially, it will be more difficult uh, to do. It's harder to undo, you, you, you know, an egg is so scrambled that it, it looks insane to unscramble it. That said, you know, I, I do think that the greatest obstacle to reaching some kind of equitable outcome, whether a two-state or one or something else, uh, is not actually the, the physical impediments, which are real and significant and not to be dismissed, uh, but rather the absence of incentive given to the stronger party to move toward any kind of uh, outcome. So the most comfortable thing is to maintain the current system. That is the least costly option, is to maintain the status quo. And so many of these discussions are premised on a false belief that Israel one day has to choose. It has to choose. It's going to give the Palestinians citizenship and equality, or it gives them sovereignty and a state. One or the other. Shit or get off the pot. And it, it's, it's, it's wrong. You know, they're, they're, it's been going on for over half a century. And Israel says, no, thank you. I don't choose either. I choose this. And nobody will accept that answer. No, really, really, you know you're going to have to choose. Do I? Who's going to make me? And, and so the real obstacle to getting toward peace, to getting toward any kind of equitable outcome, is, is actually getting to a place where Israel feels like it has to choose. And that's eons away. You know, I, th I think I'll actually read a, a small passage from um, when the uh, central character, uh, Abed Salama, a father of one of the children in the bus, was uh, imprisoned um, during the first intifada. Um, he was uh, fresh out of high school when the intifada began. This was the 1987 to 1993 uh, uprising, unarmed uprising uh, against Israeli rule that led to the Oslo Accords. Um, and, um, and I'm just going to describe um, his experience uh, in those jails because today we're seeing such a huge uh, spike in incarceration of, of uh, Palestinians. After his interrogation, Abid was sent to the Ofer prison near Ramallah, then to a detention facility in the An Anatot base, which, as it happened, was built on land confiscated from his family. Detainees used buckets as toilets. Abid stayed there for two months and was allowed to shower only twice. Next, he went back to Ofer, where he was tried and sentenced by a military court to six months, then to Dahariya again, 
and finally out of the West Bank to Israel's largest prison, Ketziot, in the Negev de desert. It was built to confine the thousands of West Bank and Gaza Palestinians rounded up during the Intifada, at a certain point holding one in every, Palesti in every 50 Palestinian men. Politically aware inmates named it Ansar III after the Ansar prison camp Israel had erected when it occupied southern Lebanon, but most referred to it by the Arabic name for the area since before Israel colonized it, the Nakab. Abid arrived in the Nakab in the winter when the temperature of the desert nights would drop below freezing. The facility was made up of more than 100 crowded tents with a couple dozen of detainees in each. Every cluster of two to four tents was surrounded by a dirt mound and enclosed with barbed wire. It was easier for Israel to control the inmates by giving some autonomy to the factions, al allowing each to run its own tent. In Abed's cluster, there was one tent for the DFLP, one for Fatah, and one for the Islamists. When new prisoners were brought in, they would line up before the heads of the factions and declare their party affiliation. Not everyone had one, so this was the moment when they had to decide. Abed saw one prisoner approach the front of the line and declare, I'm with the PLO. Everyone around him laughed. We're all PLO, one of the party leaders said, since the PLO was not a faction, but the umbrella group for all the non-Islamist parties. Okay, I'm with Abu Amar, the man offered, using the kunya or honorific for Yasser Arafat. He was put with Fatah. Two months later, Abid saw that this man, who had not known the name of the faction he joined, was now the head of Fatah education in his cluster. That, Abid thought, is how they choose their leaders. At the time, nearly half of the 13,000 Palestinians in Israeli jails were in the Nakab. The inmates included most of the more than 2,000 Palestinians held under administrative detention, that is, held without having been charged or tried and with the possibility that their sentence might be extended indefinitely. Among them were journalists, attorneys, physicians, professors, students, trade unionists, civil society leaders, advocates of nonviolence, and members of Israeli PLO dialogue groups, which were illegal. Unlike Abed, most were not told the reason for their imprisonment. Each tent set its own daily schedule. Abed's DFLP tent held ma mandatory courses in party objectives, policies, and ideology and instruction on how to withstand interrogation by the Shabak. Some inmates read and translated newspaper articles brought in by their lawyers. Televisions and radios were forbidden. Great numbers of books were banned, from Shakespeare, Tolkien, and Tolstoy to, to Solzhenitsyn and the constitutional law of the state of Israel, and none of the prisoners was allowed a family visit. The tents had no tables or chairs, and they flooded when it rained. Even during dust and sandstorms, the soldiers required the tent flaps to remain open. The barrels used for trash overflowed each day, bringing a terrible stench and an influx of mosquitoes and rats. Many prisoners developed skin diseases. But the real torment came at sunset. Every night, the Israelis would turn on the speakers and play a heart-rending ballad by Um Kultum. She was Abed's favorite singer, along with Abdul Halim Hafiz. He disliked pop music and listened only to the classics. The Israelis played a different wrenching Um Kultum song each night. Her songs were lengthy. The most famous, Enta Omri, You Are My Life, was almost an hour long. The anguished prisoners would lie on their beds, listening, homesick, some of them crying, others working on the one letter they were allowed to send each month. Abed didn't dare try to write to Ghazal. The Israelis read all the mail, and who knew how they would use the information against him, or her. Instead, he would stand outside the tent and look up at the moon, wondering if at that moment, Razo was looking at it, too. A wrenching passage. Thank you for reading it. Thank you. We have comments tonight. Comments, take some questions from the audience. Please, uh, if you have a question, briefly state your name and affiliation, um, and most importantly, make your question a question. Keep it, um... Sorry, and I just wanted to add one important thing, since I don't think it was at the door. Uh, the book is going to be published in German uh, on August 7th. It will be published by Pendragon, and um, that's the announcement. <laughs> Hi, 
Hi, good evening. Thank you so much for this um, absolutely engaging talk and uh, also brilliant questions. I'm looking forward to reading the book. I have so many questions. I will ask one and will be a question. Um, I was very interested, sorry, and I should state my name is Hannah Pfeiffer. I'm from Goethe University. Um, I was very interested in the question about Palestinian agency. And of course, a bus crash is a very, let's say, if there's already little agency, that will be the site where there's even less, right? And I found it interesting that you answered, well, um, the people also were looking towards the more immediate reasons of the accident rather than going into the systemic reasons. Um, maybe that's also what they see they can change in the moment, right? So maybe that's a way of having agency to actually address those institutions that can be held accountable, like the PA or the driver that can be you know, educated better. But I was wondering, did you ever in your um, journalistic work there experience situations where you actually see Palestinians claiming more agency, resisting the, what you call the system of control or trying to push its boundaries more structurally? Um, and I would love to hear whether you, you encountered any such examples. Thank you. Um, yeah, th there, there are um, a great many uh, examples um, of, of uh, Palestinian agency, and um, you know, one, one, some of them are famous historical periods like the uh, First Intifada, um, but others are more localized, more individual, um, and you know, one of the things that comes through in, in the book and the reporting for the book was how much each individual even is constantly facing choices about how much to cooperate with or resist the system. Am I going to work for an Israeli employer? Am I going to accept it when the Israeli employer sends me to a settlement? Uh, or I'm working in East Jerusalem, sends me to a settler home. Um, these kinds of, of decisions, you know, I have a very close uh, old colleague and dear friend who uh, worked in, in uh, lived in all his life in Gaza, and a few times we got him exit permits. Uh, it had been decades since he was allowed to leave, and we got him, uh, through the connections of my employer, we got him uniquely uh, exit permits. And he would be interrogated by the intelligence on his way out. And he would come out of there so depressed because he, he is held to his dignity and would never answer the, the, uh, their questions. But you can't exit that room not feeling dirty because they start with, what's your name? What's your address? And then inch by inch, who's your neighbor, things they know the answer to. What's this building here in the satellite photo? You know what that building is. But where, where have we, are we, have we crossed a line? Where am I? And, 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 uh, and so Palestinians are facing constantly these choices about how much to cooperate with this system of control. Um, and in terms of examples of, of, of more collective uh, resistance to it, you have famous villages in the West Bank, like Nabi Saleh, which um, is a village of only a few hundred people that would go out every Friday and protest peacefully against the takeover of their lands in the spring right next to their uh, village, and more than half of this village has served time in jail. That is the price. I mean, can you imagine a small community of, of a couple hundred, a few hundred people, and basically every single male in that community has been in jail, and huge numbers are in jail at a given time, and a lot of those people can be held indefinitely. You never know when they're going to get out. So. Uh, so there is a very, very stiff price to pay, uh, which helps to ensure that there aren't so many Nabi Salas. Hi, my name is Vivian Tobin, 
and I have a question about about your role um, in writing about these things because you worked in different areas as a journalist, as an academic, and in this case, in this kind of interstitial realm of non-fiction yet literature. And in each of those, you have a slightly different kind of position and visibility in relation to what you're writing about. So, as a journalist, you know, an, an article, even though it's clear maybe who wrote it, the, the author is less in the foreground. It's taken as something relatively objective, even though, of course, there are always subjective elements. But then with a book like this, um, even if you describe it all in a very, in a very sober and factual way, you're still now you're in a, diff in a different position from, you know, the journalist who writes an article. This, this, this medium puts you more, places you more as the, uh, let's say, as the, the the owner of this, of this uh, this text, and this narrative. Do you, do you find it challenging to navigate between these different contexts? Thank you. Um, so I think that, that that spectrum, you know, exists within um, within journalism, and there, um, you know, are different publications that land at different places on that spectrum. And so, at one extreme would be a wire service like Reuters or the Associated Press, which is basically just reporting what happened in the last hour. And um, they will quickly say what happened in the last hour in the first two paragraphs, and then they have this boilerplate of, you know, the Israeli side says this, and the Palestinian side says that. Um, and uh, Israel occupied the West Bank in 1967, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and there is a kind of, um, <coughs> the approach to that journalism is very much the we get a quote from one side, we have to get a quote from the other, and um, there is this appearance of neutrality that um, that, that journalism um, conveys. And, and then, you know, at the other end of the spectrum um, are magazines, you know, magazines like The New Yorker that uh, Josh uh, writes for. You know, the, those pieces really read uh, at their best, I think they read like short stories. They're true, they're factual, but they have been artfully constructed. There is a narrative, uh, and 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 there are choices that were made in terms of what to include and what not to include that are largely narrative choices. They're about just keeping a reader engaged. It's getting dull. It's uh, yes, this happened also, but it's a repetition. We already know it from this other example. So why repeat it? Um, and, and so I, it's a really just a matter of taste. I personally have always liked magazine journalism. Um, and um, it was my aspiration to, to write things that are more immersive and that feel more like something that could be described as a, as a nonfiction uh, novel. Um, so, so, but that was a departure for me, as, as you point out in your question. I had done much more historical and analytical and also polemical or argumentative writing uh, in the past. And, and part of the choice to write a, a work of narrative nonfiction like this that's very intimate um, was really a desire to reach a broader audience. Um, uh, writing polemic, writing history, writing analysis, you will engage the experts and the people who really care about the issue. But I found time and again that uh, very senior level officials in uh, the US, for example, and elsewhere would tell me frankly, uh, I agree with your analysis, I agree that we are supporting an indefinite uh, occupation, uh, that we are a key pillar of support for that system, and that system is immoral, and our support for it is immoral, and there is no end in sight, and all our talking points are empty. However, 
I will not do anything to change it. And the reason I won't do anything to change it is, is very practical. It's, it's that the, 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 my room for a maneuver is so tiny, the kind of incremental change that I could make would be to some tiny bureaucratic rule you don't even know about. And you would laugh at me, uh, and I would be putting my neck out on the line to change this thing and potentially lose my job and my career. And it's just not worth it. It's not worth the headache, the 40 calls from congresspersons and activist organizations, etc. Um, and so a number of those conversations eventually convinced me what should have been obvious from the beginning, which is that it was really a, largely a waste of time for me to be talking to these policymakers. And what I really needed to be working on was reaching a broader, a broader public. And the way to do that and, and to create the space for those policymakers who do have the, the right understanding but don't feel they have the ability to act on it, um, to create the space for them to act uh, in a way that they haven't before. And that was the aim with t telling a story like this one, was to, was to reach more people and, um, and open their, their, um, their hearts and, 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 and their sympathy for the people uh, living in the system. Hello, uh, my name is Yedega. Thank you for all the insights, and I'm going to buy your book for sure. <laughs> um, my question is a simple one because I'm talking to someone who also lives there. What is the, uh, is the um, sentiment changing within Israel, within the Israel community towards this topic? Are they questioning more the actions of the government? What are you witnessing? Yeah, that's my, talk, my question. Thank you. Um, so there, I think the important thing would be to distinguish between um, unprecedented levels in the last several years of uh, activism against the current Israeli uh, coalition, particularly I'm referring to the mass protests against the uh, so-called judicial reform that the current uh, government was advancing. And there was a huge mobilization, and it was really um, a mobilization of this largely secular center left to center right public um, against what they felt was um, a slow th descent into theocracy, um, and um, and so that is very real, and it's a powerful force, and it can be reawakened. Um, and we see some of that even now. Um, that is distinct from um, a mobilization against indefinite control of Palestinians. And um, on, on that, there is much more of a consensus. And if you look, uh, and that's a pre-October 7th consensus, but only an even more strongly held one post-October 7th, um, and if you look, for example, at the uh, protests against the judicial reform with these huge numbers of people who came out in the streets against the current government, denouncing it in very strong terms, um, there was an anti-occupation block within those protests, but it was very uh, small. And, um, and the basic notion that we have no choice. This is a slogan. It's like a, you know, a widely held belief by so many Israelis. We have no choice. We have. We can't. We can't give them citizenship or a state. We have to continue to control them. Uh, that that is a, a very very uh, widespread position, and it's a mistake to conflate opposition to Netanyahu and opposition to the. Uh, current coalition uh, in opposition to theocracy with op opposition to control of Palestinians. And you know, you need to look no further back than the uh, previous government. They did get rid of Netanyahu for uh, a short time. <coughs> there was a Lapid Bennett government. And 
it uh, acted no different toward the Palestinians and in some ways worse. Um, and so, and Lapid, who's you know, a big figure of the center, um, some might even want to say center left, um, you know, he was very explicit that, that uh, we're not going to be negotiating with them about a state. We have time for one or maybe two questions if we take them together. I think I see <laughs> two. Let's take them together and then you answer. Um, okay, thank you very much. My name is Andreas. I'm working with uh, Medico and I have been involved in our partners work in Israel and Palestine during the second intifada, the early 2000s. Um, my question is a bit also on the political side, and this also goes into what, what you would say, as you described also the decline of Palestinian politics and the role of Palestinian parties, political parties, a little bit, very briefly. Do you see, or would you I think that the current dynamic that happens around the protests against uh, um, the ongoing warfare um, might might revive some kind of a Palestinian politics outside outside historic Palestine, because as you as you described very clearly, this, these mechanisms of control probably stifle any kind of uh, political organization as much as they, they, they restrict the personal life. But do you see that, that this is a new dynamic or is it too early to say or is it uh, just uh, wishful thinking that out of this protest that, that are very vivid at the moment might evolve something more longer uh, uh, and not just a, a, a moment of, of despair in, in uh, the situation? Thank you. Is there another question we want to add and have Nathan answer both? Hi, my name is uh, Kerem Schamberger. I'm working for Medico International. Uh, my question is, and I'm really sorry to, to focus on Germany again, how, how, do, how you as somebody who has not been living here, I assume, uh, how do you see that the, the, the current debates uh, uh, going on in Germany about this conflict, like your room got cancelled, many other events got cancelled. How, how you, as somebody from outside, uh, use this discussion? Thank you. So, um, with respect to the, to the um, first question, I think that there is a widespread acknowledgement that Palestinian, among Palestinians, that Palestinian politics is broken and that um, the PLO is a shell of its former self and um, that the strategy of the leader of the PLO and of the leader of the PA uh, uh, has uh, gone nowhere and that something new happens to happen and that this division uh, can't continue and um, all of these feelings are very widely held but it's um, nothing has emerged yet that really appears as a likely replacement in kind, like a different type of structure. Um, it's easy to imagine, you know, Abu Mazen is very old. He could he could die uh, any day, uh, but that that wouldn't be sufficient. Uh, you know, there are many people who could replace him and potentially might be more and more difficult with time, but who could potentially keep the system in place and behave in a very similar way to him, and most of the circle around him would have the intention of doing that. Um, so I think, yes, it's too early. I don't see a real leadership uh, in the diaspora yet. Um, um, I think that you know there are many Palestinians who are inspired by how much they see global public opinion changing, how much they're seeing protests for, in solidarity with Palestinians on campuses in the US and elsewhere. Um, but, it, but in terms of an actual emergent 
alternative leader stru leadership structure, either based in the occupied territories or in the diaspora. There isn't a sign of that yet. Um, uh, with respect to Germany, you know, I would just caveat it that I, I really know very little about uh, German uh, politics, but what I have seen of, you know, uh, speakers who are critical of Israel literally being prevented entry to the country at the airport, uh, and then one of them, apparently it was an EU-wide ban, it was then subsequently prevented from entering France, I, it's insane. Um, <laughs> Uh, and, and, and to shut down a conference where some of these people were going to just speak by video, it's, it's really, it, it's insane. Now, I, I come from a country that's also insane in many respects, um, uh, the United States, and, and, you know, I was, I, there are more than a couple dozen state laws in the United States that are passed by, uh, you know, state legislatures that are, uh, very sympathetic to Israel and are working with pro-Israel organizations and uh, passing these, this legislation that is designed to curtail speech. And so, for example, I was invited to speak uh, last fall at the uh, University of Arkansas, which is a state school, so it gets state funding. So uh, according to the state law, I, in order to come and speak, they said you have to sign a pledge that you won't boycott Israel, um, and you know that that's that's a, a total violation of the free thought and free speech of, of any speaker at a university. And and so the absurdity isn't only in Germany, uh, but but I, I find it I find it very dismaying, and and I. I I think that there ought to be a bigger push back against it on purely free speech grounds. I mean, just for the health of the society, for the health of democracy. If you didn't get a chance to ask Nathan a question, don't despair. We have, as mentioned, uh, some food and drink. Uh, you can do your best to try and um, corner him as he's having a glass of wine, so try your luck. Um, I just want to finish where I started and repeat what um, a privilege it uh, has been to appear last night in Berlin and tonight in Frankfurt with you uh, in honor and uh, quite a meaningful um, experience for me to, to bring you here to Germany in uh, kind of continuation of reference to that last question to, to bring you uh, here at a time when I think your voice is um, both needed and, and I hope appreciated and judging by this room tonight I think that is the case so thank you again Nathan thank you honors